We're heading out to Fort Walsh today, home of the Cypress Hills Massacre. Follow along and let's see what we can discover together. So the incident began in the spring of 1873 when a small party of Canadian and American wolfers led by Thomas Hardwick and John Evans returning from their winter hunt. While they were camped along the Teton River, their horses disappeared overnight and lo and behold, they presumed that they had been stolen. Men traveled down south to Fort Benton in Montana and that was about five miles and asked for assistance from their local authorities. Authorities refused, so Hardwick and Evans decided to grab a little posse and come back north and chase down the Nakota people that had been responsible for the horse theft. We do know that their party totaled 13 men, and as they hit the Cypress Hills area, that was when they encountered Little Soldier and the Nakota people. Both Little Soldiers and Hammond's men were both extremely intoxicated during the negotiations. So as a result, negotiations fell apart quickly. Little Soldier, however, did offer Hammond two of his own personal horses as hostages until the missing horse could be found. However, the situation became extremely tense as women and children began fleeing from the camp and Little Soldier's men began stripping off their garments which they would typically do as they prepared for battle. Now the wolfers, who have had experience with indigenous people, regarded these actions as a signal for a fight and lined up along a riverbank, about 50 yards outside of the camp. In a last ditch effort to avoid any type of violence, Abe Farwell pleaded with the wolfers, asking him not to start shooting. However, before he could continue, Hammond did open up fire and the ref rest of the wolfers followed suit. Now here's where history kind of diverges and we get a lot of different stories. We do know that at least one American was killed, Ed Ligaris, and the number of the Nakota people that were killed varies. Official reports claim 13 men, women, and children of the Nakota people were killed. However, Lakota, sorry, Nakota elders claim up to 300 men, women, and were killed during the massacre. Now, which one would you believe? The official report or the Nakota elders? I leave that up to you. Migration, I guess. We would come this way, we would follow the buffalo, we would, we would end up here, usually in the winter time because it was more mild here. We would also um, you know, hunt and trap in this area. We would follow the river. This, by the way, the Battle Creek uh, goes all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico. Just a little trivia. <laughs> but the time of the, the massacre, I'll start there. We'll go that far back. Um, a band of Nakota had just come down from the North Battleford area. They had gone up there for different purposes and they came back this way to find provisions. They knew about the trappers, or I'm sorry, the traders, um, Solomon and Farwell. <laughs> right? Oh yeah, you yeah. got it. Okay. Keep rolling. I've been here since 2017 and I still get those names mixed up. Mm -hmm. So it's anyway, so they came down from, uh, from North Battleford, came to get provisions. And at the same time, there were some American wolfers on the on the trail of some Cree from the Kakawishtaha tribe. The Cree had stolen some horses. The Nakota happened to get blamed for them being stolen. So there was uh, that miscommunication, um, not able to speak the same languages, of course. You know, the language barriers were rampant back then. A lot of a lot of our people know English now majority of it you know but back then hardly any right so there was that um, when the battle happened there was a couple of things that came
came into play and one of them was being that one of the horses um one of the traders had lost a horse and the dakota had returned it and for their reward they were given some rotka whiskey so when the traders the, the sorry the wolfers had come seeking their horses there was a miscommunication between some drunk dakota some american wolfers that were pissed off uh, of having their horses stolen <coughs> and the Cree had gotten away, <laughs> you know, so, you know, they're gone. So, in their defense, the traders had um, come to the Nakota's defense and, and kind of stood up and said, hey, you know, these guys probably weren't the ones that did it. And so there were some horses that were being held back. The uh, wolfers had decided, you know what, until we get our horse back, we're taking this one. And there was some miscommunication about that misunderstandings and they said no and um, the battle happened after a lot of whiskey was uh, drunk a lot of people were pretty angry there was um, children uh, and women that were taken away they were hiding didn't matter those wolfers they wanted their revenge they wanted their horse back. <sighs> or horses, I should say. And um, shots were fired and a lot of our people died. The park here, the federal government, say that the numbers were about 23 people. But they didn't come here for two years. And during that time, uh, like Matthew and I were both descendants of the people that were massacred here. Um, I am the great, great granddaughter of the chief that signed uh, the tree here. Chief takes the code. I am his great, great granddaughter. Now, the people that died here, of course, their bodies are to be left on the battlefield. You know, so by the time the government gets here, two years later, there's no evidence of them. But, you know, the government decided they're going to send the RCM or the Northwest Mounted Police west, settle the west, take care of that problem that's happening over there. And down in the United States, there was also the Sioux Uprising, the uh, Battle of Little Bighorn, the uh, eventual slaughter of Custer. So the Sioux were fleeing and they were after Sitting Bull and his people. So they came here, Sitting Bull and his people, there was quite a huge number of them, somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 of them had come north. And uh, they had established, sorry, they had already established a, a relationship, a friendship with uh, James Walsh here at the fort. And he allowed them to stay and he kind of, you know, spoke for him as well, spoke up for Chief Sitting Bull. And, uh, <coughs> and they said that if it wasn't for all of these Sioux here, the Nakota probably would have been okay, like uh, ration wise. But they needed to get rid of them. They, there was a uh, miscommunication between the federal government of Canada and the Northwest Mounted Police and the Sioux people and the American government. They all wanted these, the Chief Sitting Bull and his people to go back. Knowing that, you know, he's probably gonna get killed when he goes home or goes back to the United States. During all of that time, the Nakota people were given a reserve from the Alberta Saskatchewan border down to the United States border past uh, the number one highway and out west towards and past Elkwater. That was the Nakota reserve granted to them back in 1876. Now in 1877 they signed a treaty or was it 77? Yeah, yeah 77 they were they signed the treaty they were given that reserve and after that we're gonna come back to the, where all these Sioux are over here. They needed to get rid of them. They were gonna dismantle this fort in 1883. But bef 
before that, we had signed this treaty that said that in order for us to stay in this area, because they were trying to remove us. They already wanted us gone. They didn't want us here because of, well, look how beautiful it is, right? Mm -hmm. But there was a, a train track going to be coming this way, and they were going to bring it through here. So they wanted those those Nakota out of here. They said, get them out of here. We need them gone. Figure out a way, get them gone. So there was um, part of the, the treaty was that we wanted to be educated. We wanted to know how to grow crops. If they're going to make us stay on a little plot of land, we need to know what we're doing. So they agreed to have somebody come out and teach the people how to grow crops. How to plant gardens because before that we were nomadic we picked what was there we didn't stick a seed in the ground and wait for it to grow we followed the buffalo we followed the seasons of the berries that was what we did so now we're forced to stay on a plot of land and they said okay well you show us that that's good and you know we'll, we'll work with you we were promised a lot and then they reported that it didn't work they sent reports back to Ottawa that the crops failed. They don't, they can't stay there. They need to move. So instead of letting us stay in the area, even though our crops actually did grow, they did work. They made us move to an hour east of Regina. And that's where we currently are today. However, if you go looking on the land in Southeast Alberta, you will find markers that state that it is an Assiniboine Reserve. Still to this day, over 140 years later. Crazy, huh? But that's the way the world works, and uh, we've adjusted. And about five years ago, they met, Parks Canada met with, uh, like what Joe was saying earlier, about um, having our voices being heard again out here. They invited Carrie the Kettle, Megany, Mosquito, um, Grizzly Bear's Head, and Little Pines. This is all the and people from Sitting Bull. This is all of our territory here, right? So we've had our voices um, allowed to speak here and tell our side of the story. And it's kind of carte blanche, really. We're allowed to say anything. As long as it's truthful from our standpoint this was our truth and um, those numbers of people that actually died in that massacre weren't 23. my ancestors said it was between two to three hundred people that died and that's just from that not to mention the starvation that happened because of the encroachment that happened out here and being withheld rations, our livelihoods changing so rapidly. There was also the smallpox ep epidemic and later on um, a flu, I think it was, that came around. Yes, yeah, so there was, there was a lot of things that, uh, that could have took us out. Things that were tried to take us out. We're still here. Pretty resilient. I don't think I'll ever leave these hills now. Thanks for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. payback, guys. Yeah, it's, it's worth staying in the hills for it. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we... Uh, we can kill the horses and the women. Bunch of thieving and crazy <laughs> exactly. But, you know, in fairness, um, that comes from a time where life was very different uh, modern day society thievery is frowned upon of course and all that but back in that day I would if I had to come back with a bunch of horses from my enemy camp I'd have been I'd come back a hero kind of thing right um, so there was accolades for that within our own community you know um, so depending on how you look at it uh, you know the the history is there right so yeah like we have uh, I guess the alliance now and that was established way back when too when we're getting rid of those darn old Blackfoot we 
we hooked up with the Cree, the Soto, and the Grovon, and we, we got the Blackfoot pushed back towards the Rocky Mountains. And uh, we were just talking about this earlier, about how it's kind of like a, um, a truce now. Sometimes it rears its ugly head now and then, but I, uh, I, ha I do have a friend that's Blackfoot, and, and we have that. It's not really a spoken truce, it's kind of an unspoken truce, but I said, you just stay over there and we'll get along just 